you are able, please stand to show reverence to the Lord as we join in hearing his word. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Psalm 121, 1 to 8. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps your, you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Our New Testament reading is Matthew 17, 1 to 9. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, please be seated. Good morning. I'm Kenny Foster. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we're grateful to you this morning for your word. There is no other voice like yours. Your word, Lord, reminds us that it is the source of great peace. And you, you have said, great peace have they that love your law. Lord, we love your word. And we're grateful for the Lord Jesus Christ, the living word who has opened your word to us. Help us now as it's spoken, Lord, as it is listened to. Be present and glorify your name in each heart, Lord, as only you know how to do. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. There's a fellow who was on top of the roof of his second story home putting up a television antenna. That's what you used to do to get TV signals into your home. That's before Comcast and all these other things, Fire Stick and all that stuff. Yeah. But, but it was a large and, and tall, and, it was, and he was trying to attach the guy wires from the antenna to a section of the roof. Now the wind was blowing, making it even more difficult. And suddenly he began to slip. Yeah, yeah. And he slid down that roof until he caught himself on the little metal rain gutter that went around the eaves of the second floor. And in, in a panic, he, he screamed up to heaven, isn't there anybody up there who can help me? And the voice from heaven came, I can help you. Well, what shall I do? Let go and I'll catch you. Is there anybody else up there who can help me? Yeah. yeah, you see, when, when you're asking for help, where do you look? And when you need help, don't, don't you evaluate it? You research it, you find, out if it's, if, uh, you find out its effectiveness, because you want to know that the help is reliable and that it's not going to let you down. Well, we're in the season of Lent, and we're following Jesus as the, just like Peter and James and John up a mountain. We're, follow, we're following him in his journey to the cross. Psalm 121 
is known as a traveler's song. It's one of the songs of ascent. The pilgrims, while making their, their journey to Jerusalem to worship God, would sing these songs. And singing these songs was a way of, of encouraging themselves as they made their way up to the celebration. And sometimes the trek held dangers. And along that way, you know, is, is there help along the way when you encounter trouble, when you encounter danger? And similarly, traveling through this world, through this life, you need to know where your help comes from. Now the psalm asks a great question and it gives us a great answer. The question is, from where does my help come? And the answer, my help comes from the Lord. For, for, for unpredictable and inevitable troubles, there is a transcendent sovereign presence in the Lord. And in the midst of a sea of pluralism, this is a good question. Why is the Lord our only help? Well, the psalm teaches that the Lord, he's a maker who's not a sleeper, but he's a keeper and he protects forever. So let's think about this. He's a maker. Look at verses 1 and 2. I lift my, up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. See, God, in his word, he gives us both the great question and the answer up front. But it begins with lifting the eyes to the hills. And what does that, what does that mean? Well, that word lifting, it's, it's to, to take a burden and, and placing it on something or, or someone else. Well, but why, why the hills? Well, Jerusalem was on a hill. Israel is a hilly, mountainous area. Hills were often places of worship of false gods, too. So, it could be that they looked among the hills where some would take their weight and place it before a false god. And although others looked at the false gods, the pilgrims knew their help comes from the Lord, Jehovah, the self-existent and eternal one. And since it comes from the Lord, their help is distinguished from the lesser gods, little g. Because the Lord, Jehovah, made heaven and earth. Heaven and earth belong to the Lord. So he knows how the two realms are meant to function. He knows the purpose of heaven and earth. He knows how they're meant to be one. And this is the confidence that the traveler would have as he or she made their way to Jerusalem to worship. When he looks to the hills, he finds there's no God among the hills like the Lord Jehovah who makes heaven and earth and sees them as one. The Lord Jehovah, see your eyes need to see him. Your eyes need to see the weight of your life being borne by the Lord. Because if he makes heaven and earth, then there is no burden he can't shoulder. There's no competing God out there that can bear the weight of your life like the Lord God Jehovah. So lifting the eyes is important since it's through the eyes, the goal is envisioned. The destination is kept before you. And as far away as the destination may seem, yet the size of Jehovah fills up your vision since he's the maker of heaven and earth. Heaven's stars cannot be counted. And the sands of earth's seashores are without number. So how much bigger is the Lord than the troubles you encounter on the way to worship him? And since life in those days was spent walking everywhere, you know, it's, it would be something to calculate just how much time. You know, I mean, we have cars and we drive our cars quite a bit, but can you imagine no car 
no horse, no buggy, no chariot. You had to walk everywhere that you, you go. <laughs> yeah, and if, you, if you're spent, most of your life is spent walking everywhere, then your eyes would need to see the Lord in all of his creator glory, filling your mind and imagination as you make the trek, lest you begin to look for help in other created things. The Lord is our only help since he is our maker. And then throw in this other fact about the Lord. Not only is he our maker, he's a, our maker who is not a sleeper. Look at verses three and four. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Now you and I, we need sleep, don't we? Okay, some of y'all don't. Yeah, yeah, we need, we, we need sleep. And, and, and also, you know, we, we need, we need if, you, if you have to bear a burden, you, it, it's needful that you, that you handle it without stumbling, that you can, that you can carry the load. So, so, so sleeping and stumbling, yeah, well, those two things do kind of go together. If you're sleepy you're, and you're trying to walk, you're going to stumble. You, you know, but you want to be sure-footed. You, you, in, in walking to Jerusalem, you don't want to turn over an ankle or, or break a leg or dislocate a, a hip and then end up limping the rest of the trip. See, this, this scripture says, the Lord will not let your foot be moved. Here is, as the ancients would say, a sure defense. The Jehovah provides confidence for his people to walk with him. He will not allow, the scripture says, your foot to be moved. Well, how can, how can the Lord make such a promise? Well, so the Psalms are poetry and they don't rhyme, which is what we look for in American poetry. You know, but, but this is Hebrew poetry and it states an, an idea or a concept, then it explains what it means in the next line. And this is called chiism. The, it's, it's the idea of, of feet moving. That is confidence. And the reason the confidence is high is that the reason he will not let your foot be moved, it's because he doesn't sleep or slumber. So Mesopotamian, Sumerian, and Egyptian myths and, and literature sees this lack of response from other gods to, to the problems of their people. It, it sees them as those gods are asleep. They're, laying, they're, they're, they're lying on their beds. In the archaeology study Bible, it has this Egyptian admonitions of Ipur, and it's, he's questioning that the misery that, 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 that is of the people is a result of, the, of the, sun gods, the sun god's neglect. And he asks this question, these questions, where is he today? Is he sleep? Behold, his power is not seen. Sounds like the Psalms, doesn't it? Does it sound like something that David would say? And then, then, and then too, you know, when you think of, of Elijah and he's on the mount with uh, the prophets of Baal, what does he do? He mocks them with these very tight words, right? Yell a little louder. Perhaps your God's in the bathroom. That's a loose translation of what that, that text says. Yeah, so, 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 so here, here the other cultures had the same thing about their gods, their power, their power. But see, sleeping gods don't answer your prayers. Sleeping gods are unaware of their worshipers. Sleeping gods, little g, are no gods at all. The Jehovah, the living God, is never unaware of the journey of his pilgrims. Hallelujah. Now, I can remember during my college years being a security guard at a construction site. You know, I, I was the only one on the site do, in, in the middle of the night. Uh, carrying, so if you're, if you're about to go to college, I would advise you don't get a job where you, where you get no sleep and you have to go to class the next morning. You know, don't do, yes, particularly if you're a freshman. <laughs> 
don't, don't do that. You know, so, so, I mean, it was difficult to stay awake. I mean, there were times I'd fall asleep, and I don't know how long I would be asleep. I mean, it could be 30, 45 minutes, you know, and, uh, you know, the supervisor would come around. Oh, yes, everything's fine. <laughs> I had no idea what was, I was completely unaware because I had been asleep. Well, see, the Lord is not a sleeper. He never wearies. He's not aloof. He's never overrun by the night. He's never exhausted. Now, many have accused God of sleeping on the job, but if God actually, fell, imagine if God actually fell asleep, the whole universe would collapse into chaos. Mountains would crumble into the sea. The sun would shut out its glories and refuse to shine. Asteroids and, and comets and meteors would hit our planet with greater frequency. But the Lord never sleeps. He never slumbers. I see, this is a comforting word for the saints of God. Because he's aware of your lives right now. Are you praying about anything? Are you, are you praying about an, an illness? God knows. Are you praying for wisdom in a decision you must make? The Lord doesn't have an out to lunch sign, but he's always vigilant and his ears, the scripture says, are attentive to our cries. See, are you praying for a loved one's salvation? Jehovah is the God of every circumstance. He knows exactly how to reach that son or that daughter or, or that spouse. He knows exactly how to reach them at exactly the right time. So do you think he's indifferent to your grief? He's with you through the night watches of mourning. The father of mercies is not wearied at your continual coming. You can be confident, you can be confident in your life's journey that the Lord is not an inactive, uninterested, dozing deity. You and I can rest since the Lord never sleeps or slumbers. He's not a sleeper, but he is a keeper. Look at verses 5 and 6. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. So the Lord is our maker who's not a sleeper, is actively keeping his people right now. The Hebrew word for keep, keeper is, is shamar, and it has a, a wide range of meaning. It means to, to hedge about, to have charge of, to celebrate to preserve, to treasure, to guard, to retain, and, and, and more. And this word is used six times in the text. So God is trying to tell his people, he's trying to tell his people something about how he values them. You see, the people of God were spending a lot of time walking to the temple you know, throughout the year, yeah, there's a lot of time. There's, and it would take days, and, and in some cases, weeks. Boy, some of you would have a struggle with that coming to church. <laughs> if it takes that long to go. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's, there's, there's all of this preparation that sometimes you would have to spend weeks or months preparing to take this travel. And while traveling then you're exposed to dangers of the road. During the daytime, you're exposed at nighttime to, 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 to the dangers, you know, the things that provided cover for, for thieves or, or self-inflicted injuries. You took a wrong, you took a wrong step and, and you turned over something. Yeah, yeah, you know, so there's self-inflicted injuries. So they could expect that the never sleeping, never slumbering Lord to be their shade on their right hand. And see, shade, unlike what it means today when kids use the word shade, you know, that it's, you're, you're, you're saying something disparaging about another person, but this is not what the scripture means when it says the Lord is your shade on your right hand. He's casting shade, but it's your protection. 
It's your protection. The Lord is your protection at your right hand. The right hand is the place of power and blessing. In Colossians 3.1, this is just one of the places where the Bible talks about us being at the right hand of the Father. It says this, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ is, we're seated at the right hand of God. Charles Spurgeon reminds us that he, the Lord, will bear a shield before us and guard the right arm with which we fight the foe. That member which has the most of labor shall have the most of protections. When a blazing sun pours down its burning beams upon our heads, the Lord Jehovah himself will interpose to shade us, and that in the most honorable manner, acting as our right-hand attendant and placing us in comfort and safety. You see, think about, think about how the Lord Jehovah has valued you. You're favored. Hallelujah. The God who desires and seeks worshipers ensures that his people will make it to his temple to worship him. The Lord is pursuing us and calling us to worship him. He has hedged us about he treasures us. He guards and retains us. Yet, someone might ask, if he's a keeper, then why does he allow the sick? Why does he allow suffering? If he never sleeps, why does it seem as if he does not answer our prayers? You see, those are very good questions. But to answer them, we need to look at the fourth point. The Lord is our maker who is not a sleeper, but he's a keeper who protects us forever. Look at verses 7 and 8. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. You see, in numerous places in the psalm, we get statements like verse 7, where keep you from all evil. You're like, What? You know, I, I've suffered. I've suffered evil. What is the Bible trying to say? You see, what you have to do with, with statements like these is to remember the genre of literature that you're, you're reading in the scripture, that this is poetry. So it's not meant to be taken literally as if all evil, nothing bad is ever, you're not supposed to stub your toe. You're not supposed to have a car wreck. You're not supposed to get bitten by a mosquito. You're not supposed to have an allerg allergic reaction. Now, that's not what the passage is saying. That's not, that's not the way to take it. But that's the way the devil tried to use it when he spoke to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And look at what he says, because he's quoting the psalm. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now he's, quote, he's quoting the psalms. You know, and that's you know, and. and, and and it kind of sounds like verse 7 of, 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 one, of, of Psalm 121, right? You know, it sounds like, yeah, it keep you from all evil statement. But Jesus counters the, the misuse of scripture. And he says to him, and again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So you need to understand the genre in the light of other scripture to understand what the Lord is saying. So, so to understand verses 3 through 7, you have to do so in this psalm. It's really easy, in particular in, in the light of verse 8. The keeping you from all evil, the keeping your foot from stumbling, and the Lord being your keeper. It's all a part of the Lord protecting us from this time and forevermore. You will go through sickness from this time, but it will not be forever. You, will, you may experience what seems like the Lord sleeping from this time, but it's not forever. You might be praying for healing in the corridors of the hospital in this time, but the Lord chooses to take your loved one home forever. There is the ultimate healing. And remember, we live in a, a broken world. 
And in a broken world, suffering is, is not understood in assessing blame or what caused this, but it's understood. It's in, in, in understanding God's purpose. So Jesus said this concerning the man who was born blind in John chapter 9, verse 3, when he was asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not this man, it's not, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. John Walton and Andrew Hill in, in, their, in their book, it's a reference book, you know, it's, it's, it's called the Old Testament today, and it's a journey from ancient context to contemporary rel relevance, and they make this point. Unless there's some immediately obvious or unidentifiable cause, unfaithfulness leading to divorce, drunken driving leading to one's own disability, we should turn our attention away from the past, the cause, and look to the future, purpose. See, what difficulty are you going through right now? Is it illness, a recent diagnosis, the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, a hard surgery, perhaps you're waiting for an answer to a, a prayer, it's something you've been praying for for a long time. Well, certainly we've been praying for, for Scott and Megan Dillon, for their children, Jack and Angela, to get visas so that they can come and be here with us in ministry. We've been, we've been praying and waiting. So the question, the question then, and in, in all of these, is not why, is what's the cause, as, as so much as it is, what works of God might be displayed in this now? See, the Lord intends to protect us from this time forth, not by promising that bad things won't happen, but by delivering you through them. Thus, transforming the sufferer in a broken world into a person of beauty in this world and the world to come. Now someone will ask, how can you know that the Lord will do this? Well, the text tells us we know this because he's the maker of heaven and earth. See, his purpose is to bring the two realms back together. And he does this through Jesus Christ. Remember what happens on the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus is transfigured right before Peter, James, and John. See, it's, it's a meeting. Heaven and earth are meeting. And then here's Moses and Elijah. What, did, what happened to them? Well, yeah, yeah, they, these are two people whom God has brought through some evil. Remember Moses? Moses, nobody knew where he was buried because, you know, he, he, he didn't get to go into the promised land after, after, after 80 years of struggling with folks. You know, he didn't get to go into the promised land because he, instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock and God said, okay, Moses, you forgot, you didn't honor me. So now you're not going to go see, look at the promised land, but you're not going to go in. And Moses, yeah, he went through some evil. He went through, Elijah, he went through, yeah, you know, remember his story? Yeah, he went out, he went, he went out in, a, in a whirlwind, but he was one exhausted man. You know, he, he had worn himself out trying, to, trying to, to, to show that God is the Lord. Yeah, he, he, he was worn out. He went through, but God preserved both of them through something, because here they are. They both appeared and began to talk to Jesus. Peter's enamored. Lord, let me build a tent for you, one for, one for Moses and one for Elijah too. You know, and then the, this bright cloud uh, overshadows them and a voice from the cloud says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. See, Jesus only, no one else. And now in Luke chapter 9, it's same, in the same story, that you, you hear what they talked about. Because it tells us that what they talked about is was Jesus' departure and what he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So they were talking to Jesus about his death, about his, of what was going to take place on the cross. That he was going to suffer something evil in this broken world. But notice, Jesus isn't asking why but he's focused on what it is to accomplish. 
And what does it accomplish? Well, Ephesians 1, 9 and 10 tells us that heaven, heaven and earth being reconciled so that the forgiveness of our sin is being brought into and God lavishing his grace on us. It's heaven and earth becoming one because there's what the text says that he, the Lord, is making known the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. You see, Jesus' death on the cross accomplishes this union and thus a protection that is ours forever. Hallelujah. Yeah, well did the songwriter say, when Christ the mighty maker died for man, the creatures sin so that we are kept by our Lord. Because in Jesus Christ, and through his death on the cross and his resurrection for us, our going out and our coming in is guarded by the Lord. Your life is preserved, kept. Hallelujah. If you don't know any other word today from this sermon, remember that one. You're kept. See, Jesus knows, friends, he knows what it means to be a traveler. Before he was born, he was on the road. He traveled from, from, from heaven to earth. He traveled with his parents as a baby to Egypt because the government was trying to kill him. He traveled from Galilee to Jerusalem to be the final Passover lamb. And now in him, fellow travelers, we are kept. Yes. Peter, who witnessed the Lord's transfiguration and risen from the dead, had this to say to some pilgrims who were in exile. He said this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Hallelujah. Jesus is our maker who is not a sleeper, but he is a keeper who protects us forever. It's from the forgiveness of sin to the home of a new Jerusalem where the dwelling place of God is with men, Jesus is our only help all along life's toilsome way. Let's pray. Lord, as we bow before you, as we, as we, as we come into your presence, and we are here in your presence, and your presence is here with us. Oh, Lord, thank you for being our help. Father, help us as we lift our eyes, as we take our burdens, Lord, and we, and we look around, Lord, as we see all of the hills and all the other offerings of, 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 that seem to say, we can help, we can help, we can help. Help us, Lord Jesus, to see only you on that hill far away where you are there on the cross on our behalf, bringing to us salvation that is unlike anything we've ever seen amaze us again and again with your great love. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.